So, good evening. Welcome. Uh, my name is David Kramer. I am the Joseph J. and Dora Abel Librarian. Um, that translates into academic director of the library here at the Jewish Theological Seminary, and many of you know, but I have to say with pride uh, that this is just one of the greatest Jewish libraries in the world, and as I hope you've already seen, if you've had a chance to go into the exhibit, we've got extraordinary material in virtually every field of the study of Judaica that you can imagine. Uh, this is for us a very special occasion. Every opening is a special occasion, but I, as I go in and witness the materials there and look at them and try to make some sense of them, as I'm sure you began to do, you may have found yourself making sense, or you may have found yourself saying, I don't understand what's going on here. I better go to the lecture to find out, right? And that is part of the reason that we are here. Um, it is just an extraordinary uh, assemblage of materials that you will be able to learn from and be inspired from, and hopefully um, with, the, um, um, with the insights of uh, our guest curator, you will have a chance to go back in there after we're finished and say, oh, now I get it. And you'll be able to go out on the street and say, let me tell you something about Kabbalah, right? Because I'm sure you've been waiting to do that for a really long time. Um, so, uh, first of all, uh, some thanks. Uh, these exhibits are not easy to do. Uh, we have got a limited staff and we try to create exhibitions that are rich and deep and crucially educational. Um, and so I will begin with our guest curator. He is not the only one to work on this, but I do have to say, um, as you will hear in a couple of minutes, his contributions uh, were just invaluable from beginning to end. Ellie Moseson has a BA in literature from Columbia, PhD in religious studies from BU, Boston University, teaches Jewish studies at Columbia, and his research focuses on Jewish mysticism, Hasidism, and Jewish magic. That's the official biography. The unofficial biography per for purposes of this evening is we have worked with guest curators before. One of the obligations and responsibilities of the guest curators is to help us write panels and labels. And from the very, very, very beginning, and yes, we did have to edit them, right? Everything needs editing. Anyone who has ever written uh, knows how important editing is, but these came as close to a finished product um, at the very beginning as anything I've ever seen. Um, so we thank you for this, just absolutely spectacular. Uh, and each time I read them and reread them, I learn something new. So. Thank you for that as well. Um, you'll hear more of what I'm hinting at in just a couple of minutes. I do have to add, though, um, that Ellie did not work alone on this. That's far from being the case. Um, our rare book room librarian, I'm just doing this in order of who I see, um, uh, Rabbi um, Mordechai, God, I'm Dark, yes, Rabbi Dr. <laughs> Mordechai. I'm blocking, I, I have this terrible, Marcus Mordechai Schwartz, thank you. I knew that as the official, but um, in, in points of pressure, I often forget you know, the details of names. Morty and I have known each other forever. I hope he'll forgive me for what I just did. Um, right? Slicha, Mechila? Okay, good. Um, Morty um, was foundational to this in helping to imagine the exhibit um, in um, you know, its contours and everything else and was a senior member of the team that put this together uh, from the very beginning. So Morty, thank you so much for everything you contributed. We're grateful. Sharon, Sharon Mintz, hi Sharon. Um, Sharon is our regular curator of exhibitions and of the art um, Jewish visual material collection at the library. She has been around doing exhibits for us for many, many years, both in the old uh, library and the permutations of exhibits that happened then in our new exhibits, uh, each, of one of, each one of which has been fantastic. And if you appreciate the structure, the organization, the beauty um, that went into creating this, it's a very, very rich and beautiful space. Uh, Sharon is primarily responsible for that with the people that we hire to support us um, in the creation of the exhibitions as well. Um, so those are the thanks. 
Uh, I just want to add one more thing before giving the floor to Ellie. This is difficult material, and one of the things that we wrestled with is introducing very esoteric material, a very esoteric topic uh, to people, some of whom might know, you know quite a bit about this, but many of whom, uh, which, and this would certainly include some of you, know very little about it at all. I remember with pain but fulfillment my first exposure um, to material like this. I, I was a young PhD here at the Jewish Theological Seminary, and there was a conference on the Jewish family, one of the paper, which was gonna be turned into a book. Um, one of the papers that was given at the conference on the Jewish family um, was given by a world-renowned scholar by the name of Moshe Idel. Uh, some of you will know that name. Uh, Edel was brilliant. Edel had all kinds of things to say that stretched my imagination in ways I could never um, have anticipated. Um, the problem was there are two vocabularies I had to learn. Number one, he was a Hebrew speaker, so his writing in English, when I was editing this book for publication, his writing in English needed some work. But more difficult um, than that was the fact that he was using terminology and concepts that I had never before been introduced to, right? Um, theurgic Kabbalah, uh, which I just couldn't believe, and I had to sit down and learn it. And I'm grateful for that experience uh, because ever since I've been able to get into this material more and more and more. The more I learn, the more I appreciate it, the more I appreciate it, the more it becomes part of my Jewish life and Jewish imagination. I hope that you will have the same experience here tonight. Uh, and if you don't have enough time to get through all the details, we'll be open till 7.30, so after the lecture, you're welcome to go back in and look at the material. Um, but come back again and bring a group if you find it interesting. Bring friends. We want to bring in as many people as we can. Ellie, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, uh, David, uh, and thank you all for coming. Uh, it's really a great honor and pleasure to be here today and to introduce to you the new library exhibit. Uh, the theme of the exhibit is uh, the visual element uh, in Kabbalistic texts. And the following remarks are meant to provide some uh, theoretical and historical background uh, to better appreciate the artifacts uh, included in the, in the exhibit and their historical, religious, and cultural significance. Now, I'll begin with a brief overview of the emergence of the Kabbalah and some of its main ideas, uh, and then we'll look at a series of images and artifacts uh, and explore some of the mystical, magical, and devotional meaning that they held in the various schools and traditions of the Kabbalah. Now, Kabbalah is a term that uh, is often misunderstood. It, uh, the verb likabel in Hebrew means to receive, and so Kabbalah uh, connotes something like received tradition. And in the medieval period, this, uh, uh, this term came to be used to refer especially to oral traditions of an esoteric nature. And, but what we refer to today as the Kabbalah uh, is a mystical tradition that arose in Provence, in southern France, and in northern Spain in the uh, 12th and 13th centuries. The Kabbalists claim that it, uh, it's a tradition as old as Judaism itself, and it, and it uh, uh, represents the true secret meaning of, uh, of Judaism. But uh, uh, it's true that its roots uh, has many roots in earlier periods, but it is very much a, uh, uh, it reflects the, re the uh, religious debates and concerns of Jews in the medieval period. It's very much a medieval uh, phenomenon. In many ways, the Kabbalah can be, uh, can be understood as a response to the uh, increasing cu uh, cultural assimilation of Jews in Christian and Muslim uh, lands, and especially to the spread of uh, rationalism. Medieval rationalism presented a number of challenges uh, to traditional Jewish belief and practice, um, but there were, and especially in two, two, there were two aspects of the tradition that uh, were particularly vulnerable to uh, a rationalistic critique. So the first was the meaning and purpose of the commandments. Right? Uh, the many rituals that Jews traditionally are to, uh, uh, perform. Um, why should they keep doing uh, these often very strange, uh, uh, seemingly meaningless uh, practices? 
And the second uh, was the Bible, right? the sacred text of uh, Judaism. Many aspects of the biblical narrative seemed problematic to uh, philosophically minded readers. Uh, and uh, uh, the anthropomorphic conception of God uh, presented, uh, that's uh, the, the idea of God presented in the Bible, uh, was especially problematic um, for these uh, uh, rationalists because it clashed with prevailing uh, uh, philosophical views of God as uh, transcendent, abstract, um, beyond all images and forms. Now, Jewish, Jewish philosophers responded to these challenges by arguing that biblical narratives were allegories. They, uh, they're allegories, the anthropomorphisms uh, we apply to God are to be understood metaphorically. God doesn't have a body, so we have descriptions of God as having limbs uh, or emotions. This uh, should not be taken literally. They're simply metaphors for, uh, 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 that are borrowed from human experience to make God more relatable to us. Now, the commandments were also rationalized uh, in various ways, and especially by explaining uh, them as actions meant to help us cultivate certain moral behaviors, certain intellectual virtues. Uh, and uh, in this way, the philosophers developed an essentially rationalist, universalist, uh, form of Judaism. The Kabbalists, on the other hand, rejected this interpretation of Judaism and they articulated a much more mystical and particularistic uh, Judaism of their own. And so th they accepted the, the philosophical notion of divine transcendence, uh, God is beyond all form and images, but they uh, nevertheless insisted that uh, uh, this transcendent God, uh, they, they called uh, uh, Ein Sof, the infinite, this uh, uh, um, transcendent uh, God, emanated from within itself, irradiated out of itself a series of human-like attributes um, through which it created the world and continued to interact with it. Now, the divine uh, attributes that the Ein Sof, the infinite, uh, emanated are ten in number, the ten Sfirot. The term Sfira derives originally from the Sefer Yitzira. This is an ancient work of cosmology. Uh, and there it simply means, uh, it's the word for number. Uh, the verb, the spore, means to count. So Sfira there meant, uh, uh, refer to the mathematical principle underlying uh, the structure of the cosmos. So it's a, a, a mathematical uh, concept. But under the influence of another uh, ancient work, a very enigmatic work known as uh, Sefer HaBahir, the Book of Illumination, the Kabbalists developed a much more dynamic understanding of the Sfirot as comprising the various aspects of the divine persona. The Sfirot were attributed human characteristics, and, uh, and they were even gendered, male or female. Uh, the tenth and final Sfira, Malchut, uh, kingship was identified by the Kabbalists with the rabbinic notion of the Shekhinah, the divine present, and it was given special prominence as the female aspect of God. The Sfirot also included positive and negative tendencies. Uh, and uh, the ideal state of the Sfirot was one of harmony between uh, uh, the positive and, uh, and negative poles, right? harmony and balance within among these attributes. Now, as a, a kind of interface, uh, you can uh, think of it as uh, an uh, interface between the transcendent God on the one hand and creation on the other, these spherod reflected the state of the cosmos uh, as a whole. When humanity, and especially the, the Jewish people, follow God's will, the spherod function in harmony with each other and peace and blessing permeate creation. But if they do not, then uh, this causes a disharmony or imbalance among the uh, attributes, and this in turn brings about pain, suffering, and exile in, in the world. The Kabbalists went on to connect the many elements of uh, the Jewish tradition, from biblical figures to ritual objects, uh, and they connected to one or another of 
the Sfirot. And in this way, uh, pretty much the entirety of the Jewish tradition was turned into a series of symbols uh, of the divine attributes uh, and their various interrelations. And with this system of the Sfirot uh, and all of their symbolic associations, the Kabbalists were able to develop new and creative responses to the rationalist challenges to traditional uh, Jewish belief and practice. They explained the anthropomorphic depictions of God in the Bible and in rabbinic literature as referring to the divine attributes, the Sfirot. Right? God in itself, the Ein Sof, doesn't have a body or any uh, form, but when there is a reference to God's right hand in the Bible, it actually refers to the attribute of chesed, or, uh, love, God's anger, to the attribute of gura, of strength, and so on. And so the narratives of the Bible were interpreted not as allegories about moral or philosophical truths, uh, the way the philosophers had done, but as a series of symbols describing the various states and interactions of the spherot. And for the Kabbalists, the Bible itself became a kind of biography of this emanated divine persona. This notion of the Sfirot enabled the Kabbalists to give meaning to Jewish ritual that was, again, not simply allegorical. We don't perform them because they convey some positive message or help us cultivate certain virtuous behaviors. Uh, as the philosophers had claimed, religious ritual actually has a direct impact on the cosmos as a whole. It increases harmony among the spherot and brings about blessings in the world. Now, one major advantage that the Kabbalists had over the philosophers when it comes to explaining uh, Jewish, Jewish ritual was that they were able to give explanations for even the most minute details of specific rituals. Right? And that was something the, philo uh, the philosophers really struggled to do. Why exactly this number of times or these components? Um, uh, it doesn't lend itself to philosophical allegory very well. And it was especially this ability to give cosmic meaning to the endless minutia of Jewish ritual practice that made the Kabbalah such a powerful and compelling interpretation of Judaism. And in fact, by the early modern period, it became the de facto meaning of Judaism for Jews across the world. The purpose of Jewish ritual was to bring about harmony in the Godhead and the Bible and other traditional texts contain uh, the coded instructions for accomplishing this goal. Now, the, the Kabbalists expounded their teachings about the Sfirot and the deeper meaning of sacred scripture in numerous books and commentaries. But their metaphysical and mystical uh, uh, theorizing was not limited to words. Right? And very soon we find Kabbalistic works employing visual elements uh, and strategies to explain their increasingly complex ideas. So the earliest known example of this development is found in a book uh, called Share Ora, The Gates of Light. Uh, this is a classic exposition of the Sfirot by the 13th century Kabbalist Joseph Jikatila. And in a particular section of the work uh, uh, where he explains uh, some of the fine points of the, sphir the spherotic structure, Jikatila included a diagram of the spherot depicting the specific relationships uh, uh, that he had been trying to describe in words. So he, he resorts to a kind of visual representation to help uh, uh, convey his, his ideas. Uh, by the way, uh, when um, uh, I should mention, whenever you see the blue frame around a, a picture, that means that this is uh, something you can see uh, in the exhibit. Not all the images will be in the exhibit, but when you see that, uh, you can go and look for it afterwards. Now, as we'll see, depicting the spherot was a ma became a major focus of Kabbalistic scribes, but other aspects of the cosmos were also visualized in Kabbalistic literature. One of the most prolific creators of Kabbalistic diagrams was uh, the 14th century Kabbalist David ben Judah Hasid, uh, and he made extensive use of diagrams to render complex uh, Kabbalistic ideas in visual form. And this is um, from one of his works uh, expounding a particularly anthropomorphic uh, section of the classic Kabbalistic work, the Zohar. And he has many, many of these types of uh, uh, diagrams and illustrations. 
Uh, the exhibit includes uh, diagrams from another one of his works uh, where he discusses the various layers of the metaphysical universe and the different spiritual entities uh, that inhabit each one. Uh, but given, given the centrality of the spherot uh, uh, within Kabbalistic doctrine, it was by far the most popular subject for visualization uh, within Kabbalistic literature. And in fact, it didn't take very long before uh, diagra diagrams of the spherot were produced independently of any written work. Uh, in other words, they began to be produced as standalone artifacts. They weren't just kind of illustrations for a particular text, but they were uh, their own kind of uh, artifact. Uh, typically produced on large pieces of parchment, these spherotic diagrams came to be referred to as ilanot, trees. Uh, and this is a, a common uh, term uh, in the medieval period for these types of relational diagrams. Um, now, the ilanot were probably first designed to help Kabbalists visualize their abstract ideas about the divine form, but they eventually came to be used in uh, mystical contemplation and, as we'll see, even uh, as magical amulets. Now, th the diagrams of the Svirot were uh, directly patterned on the form of the human body, uh, going from head, to, from head to toe, and they reflect the Kabbalist's clear anthropomorphic conception of the divine. Uh, the upper three spherot um, represent the head and brains. Uh, then you have the right and left arms, chesed and gvura, uh, if you can read the Hebrew. Then uh, the, uh, the torso in the middle, and then the right and left legs, and finally the male and female uh, genitalia. Now, while most ilanot, like this one, was generally abstract enough not to offend traditional uh, Jewish sensitivities about depicting God in, uh, in natural form, uh, some scribes did at times uh, incorporate more or less clearly human features into their diagrams. And um, you can see here on the same uh, page, uh, in another small diagram of the Sphirot, um, uh, uh, the, the Sphirot here are mapped onto the form of a human face. Over time, the doctrines of the Kabbalah grew more and more complex, and the Ilanot became more and more elaborate to keep up with, uh, with these new developments. And they often went beyond the mere depiction of the Sphirot and incorporated a broad range of textual and visual uh, material. Now, such elaborate Ilanot are neither books Right? Uh, and they're not uh, simply diagrams either. They're, they're what scholars uh, call iconotexts. They're a kind of hybrid artifact uh, in which the visual element is as central to the overall meaning as the uh, textual element. One of the grandest Ilanot ever produced is known as the Magnificent Parchment. It was composed around the year 1500 in Italy, and it depicts the cosmos as it was understood by Italian Kabbalists in this period. We have, uh, here we have not only uh, uh, the spherot, but uh, incorporated below the spherot is a detailed diagram of the planets and the constellations. Um, the Ilan also contains illustrations of uh, myth, uh, mystical themes and scenes from the Bible and rabbinic literature, as well as a large selection of citations from across the broad spectrum of Kabbalistic literature. Several copies of this, it's hard, it's hard to see, uh, to get a sense of how big it, it actually is. You'll see part, parts of them in the exhibit. It exists in various, uh, some copies uh, still exist in various collections around the world. Um, and one of the most complete, uh, which you can see on the left, is held at the Bodleian, Bodleian Library in Oxford. But quite a few of them survive uh, only in fragments. And uh, at the exhibition, we have two, uh, two such fragments, uh, actually from two different copies of uh, uh, the magnificent parchment, one containing the top 
third of the uh, Ilan and the other, the bottom third of the Ilan. Now, as was the case with the magnificent parchment, the Ilanot tended to reflect the state of the Kabbalah in the period and place of its uh, uh, production. And so as the Kabbalah tradition uh, developed over time, the Ilanot changed accordingly. One of the most uh, significant developments in the history of the Kabbalah was the spread of a particularly complex uh, system of Kabbalah that was taught by the 16th century uh, Seferian Kabbalist Isaac Luria. Lurianic Kabbalah greatly expanded the structure of the Svirot and recon reconfigured it into five distinct personas, each with, a, uh, with one or more sets of ten Svirot. Right? And all of these uh, were set to change form uh, as they developed over time. What this meant was that there were now numerous uh, uh, spheratic substructures uh, that maintain various dynamic relationships with each other. So the, 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 this new complexity of the Lurianic system and especially the temporal dimension, the, uh, the dimension of time that it introduced led to the development of a new form of the Yilan to uh, better keep track of all the layers and interactions uh, uh, among the various divine personas. Instead of a single tree of ten spherot, you now had many different trees connected to each other at various points and in various ways. The new system also called for the use of much larger scrolls right, to capture the successive changes that the spheratic structures were thought to undergo over time. And Lurianic Ilano are therefore typically drawn on uh, long vertical scrolls known as rotuli. Uh, you unroll them um, uh, vertically. As the reader unrolled the scroll, they could follow the gradual unfolding of the cosmic structure as, uh, that was depicted in the Ilan. Now, one of the most precious of the Lurianic style Ilanot in this exhibit is, uh, was composed around 1729 by the Italian Kabbalist, philosopher, and poet Moses Chaim Lutzato, uh, known as the Ramchal. Lutzato was a, a controversial figure. He uh, developed his own unique uh, version of the Lurianic system. Um, and uh, at, at the JTS library actually owns another Ilan he composed 10 years later, but only the earlier one is currently on display. But both of these Ilanot show this great Kabbalist working through the very complex structures of the Lurianic Kabbalah and trying to visualize them with the aid of spheratic diagrams. Now, the Kabbalistic tradition focusing on the structure of the cosmos and the system of the spherot uh, came to be known as the Theosophical or Spheratic Kabbalah. But it wasn't uh, the only form of Kabbalah, and another uh, important Kabbalistic tradition was founded in the 13th century by a brilliant, highly original Kabbalist by the name of Abraham uh, Abulafia. Abulafia's school of Kabbalah, known as ecstatic Kabbalah, focused less on the spherot and the various interrelations and more on the mystical power of the Hebrew alphabet. Basing himself in part on ideas found in the Sefi Yitzirah, Abulafia developed meditative techniques that involved combining the letters of the Hebrew alphabet and especially the various names of God. These techniques, according to Abulafia, were supposed to lead to a kind of trance state that he believed was akin to prophecy. So for him, Kabbalah was not uh, uh, just a framework for understanding God or uh, the Jewish tradition, but a path towards mystical union with the divine. Here you can see uh, a section of one of his mystical uh, guidebooks, Chaye Olam Haba, uh, one of his most famous works, uh, The Life of the Future World, where he employs circular diagrams as part of his letter, uh, uh, his techniques of letter combination. In this work, uh, 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 one of three, he wrote three commentaries he wrote to the Sefi Tzirah, he uses a particular spatial layout 
to visually demonstrate some of the mystical properties of the Hebrew alphabet. But even the Theosophical Kabbalists took a deep interest in uh, the Hebrew alphabet, and especially the names of God, and these came to play a central role in Kabbalistic prayer. The various names of God found in the Bible functioned as symbols for the Sphirot, and the worshiper was supposed to meditate on these names and various combinations of these names as they recited their prayers. It was believed that visualizing the names and unifying them in one's mind brought about parallel unifications among the Sfirot. These intentions, known as kavanot, were often quite elaborate, and the Kabbalists composed special prayer books containing charts of the various names uh, to be meditated upon at every point uh, in the liturgy. The prayer book seen here was the first to be printed um, with the particularly elaborate kavanot uh, of the Lurianic Kabbalah. Uh, and these pages uh, here contain just a portion of the special intentions that are supposed to accompany the recitation of the Betheim Shema. And here you can see uh, um, uh, the intentions for just the very first word of the Shema according to the prayer book of the great 18th century Yemenite uh, Kabbalist Shalom Sharabi. Now, these uh, kind of endless uh, 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 combinations of names that accompany uh, each word of, of the prayers. Now, another important sub tradition of the Kabbalah is what is known as Christian Kabbalah. <clears throat> During the Renaissance, a number of European uh, philosophers took an interest in Jewish subjects, and uh, in Kabbalah in particular, and, uh, uh, and this was part of their rediscovery of uh, uh, ancient secret, uh, uh, right, uh, 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 ancient wisdoms uh, that they uh, were trying to recover in, uh, during the Renaissance period. And Renaissance humanists like Pico della Mirandola who studied uh, uh, Hebrew with uh, an Italian Kabbalist by the name of Yochanan Alamano, uh, they viewed the Kabbalah as an ancient secret tradition containing philosophical and religious truths. And not only did these Christian scholars study Kabbalistic works, but they, uh, 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 and they did so very intensively, but they also translated many of them, and, uh, uh, and e they even printed quite a few. In fact, the very earliest printed work of Kabbalah uh, was uh, the, the book uh, Portea Lucis, uh, which is a, a, a Latin translation of uh, Share Ora, the work by Joseph Gicatila we mentioned uh, before. Uh, and this was a Latin translation of this uh, earlier uh, Kabbalistic work, and it was the first book containing a work of Kabbalah to ever be printed. And this work was uh, printed in uh, 1516. It also contains the first diagrams of the Sphirot uh, ever printed as well. So the, the, this this uh, really fascinating uh, uh, text um, uh, and a uh, really pioneering text in the history of Kabbalah. One of the most important Christian Kabbalists was uh, Christian Knorr van Rosenroth, who published a large, enormous collection of Kabbalistic works under the title Kabbalah Denudata, the Kabbalah Unveiled. And here you can see on the left, the frontispiece of this uh, collection, it presents an, uh, an elaborate allegory in which the Kabbalah is personified as a beautiful maiden entering the chambers of secret knowledge as she gazes up at the 10th spherode embedded in the sphere of the sun. Now, this comp compilation is especially interesting because it's the first to include extensive material from the new Lurianic um, school of Kabbalah. Not only does it include uh, translations of Lurianic texts, but it also includes the very first printed examples of the very elaborate uh, Lurianic Ilanot that we saw before. You can see some of that on, on the right. In fact, some of these diagrams were subsequently used by Jewish Kabbalists 
in producing their own versions of the Rianne Kilanot. And we have here uh, uh, a very interesting uh, example of a productive collaboration of sorts between Jews and Christians in the realm of Kabbalah. Now, a notable characteristic of the sacred is that it is very often viewed as a source of magical power. And this was uh, the case as well with many Kabbalistic rituals, images, and artifacts. In fact, the perceived connection between magic and Kabbalah was so strong that the tradition of Jewish magic as a whole came to be referred to as practical Kabbalah. Kabbalah put to practical use, as opposed to theoretical Kabbalah, uh, the more mystical teachings that we've been discussing. Uh, and, and, even, uh, and this, even though most of what is included under the name practical, practical Kabbalah has very little to do with Kabbalah per se, uh, but they were perceived to be part of um, the same tradition. Like the theoretical Kabbalah, the practical Kabbalah uh, also employed a broad range of images uh, and other visual elements um, in its books, in its rituals, and in its artifacts. Images have a, an ability to concretize abstract ideas in very visceral ways, and this uh, can greatly increase the uh, perceived efficacy of a magical object or a magical ritual. And so it's not surprising that Ilanot, uh, uh, with their relatively concrete depictions of the divine, were uh, attributed special magical powers. So, for example, at the head of this uh, large Lurianic Ilano, Ilan, the scribe wrote, I write this Ilan so that I may be successful in everything I do. Uh, this may not have been uh, uh, his only motivation in composing this very elaborate Kabbalistic artifact, but he nevertheless took the opportunity to capitalize on the magical power it embodied. In the 19th and early 20th centuries, Ilanot began to be composed purely for apotropaic purposes, for protective uh, as protective amulets, and these became quite popular, especially among Jews in Muslim lands. And here uh, is just a selection of images from several online auction houses uh, of such miniature uh, ilanot produced to be worn as amulets. That's what they were made for, not to be studied or uh, consulted, but to be rolled up and, and worn as an amulet. Jewish magic also drew extensively on the powers of both angels and, and demons, and such beings were often rendered visually in order to invoke and manifest their power. And it, such renderings give us insight into how such supernatural beings were imagined by magicians and Kabbalists. And here are two, two such images. Um, can anyone tell which is a demon and which is an angel? Or are they both demons or both angels? Any uh, guesses? So um, the figure on the left is supposed to be um, an angelic being invoked for protection. Uh, it's the central feature of a quite elaborate amulet that was composed for a woman named Razel, the daughter of Shandal, who appears to have been suffering from some sort of affliction, possibly epilepsy or anxiety. And we have several examples of this uh, uh, figure uh, are, are known from various amulets and magical books, uh, like the one on the right, uh, which is a, a, from a magical uh, a collection where the angelic entity, if you look closely, is depicted holding two magic swords in its hands as well, so further increasing their protection. But uh, this amulet um, includes a feature that appears to be unique, as far as I know. It incorporates an ilan into the figure uh, at the center. If you look closely, you can see at the top the word keter, and then you have uh, chokhmah and bina at the right and left of the head, and then uh, Gudula, Gvura, that's Chesed and Gvura, uh, and the two arms, and so on. 
In other words, the anthropomorphic diagram of the spherot has been mapped onto uh, this angelic figure, presumably to strengthen its uh, connection to the divine and to increase the overall magical power of the amulet. Now, to go back to the figure on the right, um, right uh, dressed as a uh, 18th century European gentleman, perhaps, uh, is actually none other than, can anyone read uh, the, on the left page, the right, right mo uppermost uh, circle on the right? Anyone who knows uh, Hebrew well enough? Yeah, Lucifer. So this um, a very uh, well-dressed Lucifer. Um, and this is from a book containing uh, instructions for conjuring any one of a hundred uh, different demons each with their own specialty that you can call upon. So, for example, this, this one um, goes by the name of Liridon and can literally make money grow on trees. Uh, and we have a the, uh, uh, the uh, in the exhibit it's open to a different page and you can uh, try to decipher what, uh, uh, um, what its specialty is. Now, this work is part of a, a very rich and complex uh, form of magic that uh, combined elements from Muslim, Christian, and Jewish magical traditions. Figures and diagrams are a major feature of Jewish magical literature and one of the most important magical collections uh, on the title, uh, under the title Raziel HaMalach, the Angel Raziel, uh, it contains quite a few uh, uh, such images, including what is prob probably the most famous image in all of Jewish magic. You may have seen this before in some uh, uh, some place or in some form. It um, and this is an extremely popular amulet uh, for protecting a newborn um, child from the uh, child-killing demoness Lilith. According to ancient Jewish legends, Lilith was, was uh, Adam's first wife, but she rebelled against him and became the mortal enemy of all his descendants. And uh, this particular amulet is based on a, uh, a mythical tale that recounts how three angels named Sanoi, Sansanoi, and Smangov were sent to stop Lilith, and she promised that whenever she hears their names um, uh, or sees their images drawn, she will refrain from harming uh, the newborn child. In this printed version, you actually have two different drawings of the three angels side by side. Um, neither of them are exactly, I think, what we would imagine an angel to look like, but there you have it. This, this amulet was frequently printed um, as, uh, separately as a broadside to be hung up in the home of a newborn, and it's still used for this purpose in some Jewish communities to this day. Another very popular image uh, attributed both deep Kabbalistic meaning and magical power was the transcription of Psalm 67 in the form of a menorah. And this beautiful example, uh, composed by hand, was inserted into a uh, early 19th century, uh, into a, 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 a prayer book, a printed prayer book by the early 19th century Italian Kabbalist Abraham Reggio. Kabbalists believe that reciting this psalm in this form, so out of this form of the menorah, it granted one special protective powers. And focusing on this image, like so many expressions of popular piety, was an act that was uh, at the same time magical and devotional. And we mentioned earlier the practice of, um, uh, of contemplating the names of God and the various combinations of the names of God. Um, uh, and this was uh, done during prayer, but uh, like the menorah, the names of God were also attributed um, great magical power. And, uh, for example, here on the left, you have a series of divine names, uh, and it's recommended uh, 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 that it be meditated upon in, uh, um, in the event of communal danger. So if the community is uh, going through some, uh, uh, is under some threat, 
you are supposed to um, meditate on these combinations of God's name. With the popularization of the Kabbalah in the early modern period, many of these practices were adopted by the general Jewish population as well. It kind of uh, uh, wasn't any longer just uh, something that Kabbalists knew, knew about or uh, were involved in. The menorah diagram became especially popular and was frequently produced as a large plaque, typically with the tetragrammaton uh, and other names of God in it. And here we have a beautiful uh, woodcut on the left, uh, uh, a woodcut plaque so, uh, uh, from, the 18th, from 18th century Salonica, and another hand-drawn one from 19th century Italy, both uh, very beautiful uh, uh, plaques. And these plaques are known as shivitis, right? uh, and it gets its name from the uh, verse uh, from Psalms, of Psalm 16, I have placed the Lord before me at all times, and uh, these were often hung up in, uh, in synagogues to increase uh, a sense of divine presence. And, uh, and here you can see this uh, synagogue, this is uh, in a Hasidic, Bob uh, of Hasidic uh, synagogue in Brooklyn. Uh, you have an enormous shiviti, uh, essentially built into and across the uh, entire eastern wall. Now, shivitis were also hung up in, in the home as a protective amulet, uh, which is yet another example of, um, of the kind of dual magical and devotional function of many uh, Kabbalistic images. So as we've seen, uh, images were uh, a central feature of uh, the Kabbalah throughout its long and rich history. Kabbalists embraced a deeply anthropomorphic conception of the divine, and they employed images uh, as a way to elucidate, to contemplate, to interact with, uh, and uh, to manifest the divine presence in their lives. Some of the artifacts we looked at functioned as intellectual tools to help scholars make sense of Kabbalistic doctrine or to keep track of complex mystical uh, uh, intentions, but they also often served ordinary people as objects of devotion or sources of magical power. With the popularization of Kabbalah, many of the visual elements of this tradition became a part of the general heritage uh, uh, of Jewish culture. And, uh, and where they continue to develop and take on new meanings to this day. So I invite you to um, explore some of these wonderful artifacts uh, in person in the exhibit and I hope you enjoy them as, as much as I have. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ali, uh, for that enlightening uh, and directing uh, presentation. I want to thank all of you for being here. Ellie will be here if you have any questions um, afterward. Uh, we invite you to, first of all, go out and take some food if you like still. Um, and I should say before, first of all, to go back into the exhibit if, if you've been in before or to go in if you haven't yet had a chance and enjoy many of the materials that you saw here. Um, appreciate just its beauty uh, and dive into some of the texts. Uh, and we're all around if you have questions. So thank you for coming. <laughs>